Thanks so much for letting me be part of the conversation today. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I prepared some remarks to read just so I can keep well under time, uh, but I have a lot more information on my blog if folks want to um, look that up afterwards and I'm looking forward to the, the larger discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about Davos, so we're, we're speaking of elections, but also there are folks sort of behind the election. So that, that is my focus today is what else is going on. Um, we are living in tumultuous times uh, with polarizing political theater and pandemic providing ample cover for the rollout of the fourth industrial revolution. From the World Economic Forum's outpost at San Francisco's Presidio, the tentacles of dispossession triggered by Klaus Schwab's Great Reset are rapidly encircling the globe. And we are witnessing the culmination of a century of machinations uh, by Western social engineers. We are seeing predatory philanthropy uh, use such euphemistic framing as living cities, um, healthy cities, resilient cities, and building back better to package the profoundly anti-human and anti-life activities uh, coming out of Davos as aspirational goals for smart living. Um, the oligarch class asks us to play along with them and overlook the fact that all of this smartness uh, rests on a foundation of continued growth, uh, fossil fuel expansion, child labor, toxic waste, and space pollution. Uh, they demand that we overlook the insatiable energy requirements needed to run the augmented of things, um, augmented reality internet of things illusion, and that we put out of our minds the existence of the vast data centers cooled 24 seven with the water of a thirsty and poisoned world. They've outdone themselves propagandizing youth to cheer on transnational global capital's plans to implement a final green solution. Though my hope is that after months of digital alienation, people's spirits will stir in time to derail the intentions of the cruel biocapitalist regime, ready to push us away from our rightful connections to natural systems and one another and into isolated virtual realms. The spell of faux ICT, um, individual communication technology sustainability must be broken. Uh, predatory debt finance has gotten a, a spit and polish makeover rebranded as circular economies and now stakeholder capitalism to make it more palatable. Post COVID poverty mining enterprises will emerge from the ashes um, and smart sensor networks, predictive policing and public private partnerships will latch onto shell shocked families trying to pick up the pieces. Um, and while Bitcoin loving agorists dream of liberation on blockchain, central bankers have entirely different envisions, uh, things in mind. Uh, they are conjuring a future of data flowing through digital wallets, uh, fuel for an emergent social impact economy, one that has been carefully plotted out for third sector and now fourth sector implementation by social finance and Sir Ronald Cohen, Harvard Business School graduate and father of UK venture capital. So Bloomberg Philanthropies, a uh, digital innovation project in the Global Parliament of Mayors uh, based out of The Hague, uh, will ensure that GovTech and open data platforms are ready to deliver all the data these markets need. Conveniently, a new operating system for government developed by Neil Kleiman of NYU's GovLab and Stephen Goldsmith of Harvard Kennedy School's Data Smart City Solutions will permit politicians of all stripes to deftly shift accountability for devastating policies onto faceless cadres of analysts. Data dashboards have proven effective weapons in swaying populations conditioned for compliance. It is difficult to effectively direct public sentiment against something as ephemeral as an algorithm. The war on terror has been swapped for pandemic preparedness, which could work out well for the World Bank's efforts to grow their vaccine and pandemic bond markets. Now we all pose threats to state security simply by living in a human body. Robot dog, robot police dogs, drones, facial recognition, uh, cameras, wearable sensors, and biometric tracking are now framed as vital investments needed to keep communities safe in what is rapidly becoming a global open air prison. Track and trace free range humans, look to industrial farming, look to wildlife management, look to Gaza, look to the Commons Project. Common Pass is not their only venture, not by a long shot. It is not just air travel that Rockefeller Foundation and the World Economic Forum intend to regulate. In their imagined future, presentation of tokenized credentials will be required to go to work, to school, to the store, to access public buildings and events. Such micromanagement was unfathomable a mere months ago, at least to everyone not in on the scheme. 
And so when we speak of politics, when we speak of citizens' rights, um, this is the game changer. Who voted in Common Pass? Who decided individual liberties will now be governed by apps advanced by corporate interests that stand to profit from population control? How relevant will national borders be in an age of real-time geofencing? Past laws have long been used to control targeted populations on Indian reservations, in Nazi Germany, in Palestine, in apartheid South Africa. And now we have CERCO, now we have legal discrimination based on health status. In this bio global biosecurity state, on any given day, the border could very well end up being your own front door. And so if we don't object, moving forward, blockchain tokens representing all sorts of digital assets, including rights and privileges, will be held in digital accounts. Social entrepreneurs need these biometric identity systems in place in order to install their planned impact economy. Using health status as an issue of national security, our hijacked governments plan to impose this upon us, not for our own good, but because the biocapitalist bio agenda must proceed. And few realize it, but co the COVID drama is providing cover for a far more insidious program of perpetual tracking and tracing tied to health management and sustainable development goal three. Health data is creating new equity markets, meaning more and more wearable health tech surveillance. The impact management projects, practitioners, the asset holders whose greed um, led to a world beset by chronic illness have structured new profit centers in Internet of Things preventative care, social determinants of health weaponized. What we are living through is not a public health emergency, but a reset of the global economy managed from Davos on behalf of the finance, technology and defense sectors. This new normal is totalitarianism wrapped in a shiny green bow. So the post-COVID world will be characterized by a welfare dependency on a scale heretofore unimaginable, justifying the creation of innovative new human capital debt products. Portfolios of people, um, poor people will emerge as a new asset class enabled by pay for success government contracts. Education, training, healthcare, counseling, nutrition, housing services, all aligned to the UN Sustainable Development Goals to generate the metrics needed to satisfy con contractual obligations and financial dealings. The richness of life narrowed to fit the stingy confines of a data analyst's uh, worldview. Uh, this is a diagram featuring a digital wallet where food assistance funds are stored on blockchain with coded nudges guiding a recipient's food purchase behaviors. The state of Illinois blockchain task force developed this thought experiment, but similar, similar digital food payment programs are in place managing uh, dispossessed people. The UK company Iris Guard is a major player in this space. Additionally, the NHS has made arrangements to purchase DNA nudge bands tied to COVID testing, um, regulating food choices. It makes you wonder where the DNA from the testing is going, doesn't it? Likely into an academic tech transfer hub, such is biocapitalism. And so the stakeholder capitalists cannot profitably mine poverty without biometric identification that will be used to aggregate all the interoperable data in smart environments. And vaccine registries will be key to rolling out this program. Gavi is a major player with Gates sitting at the pinnacle of the stakeholder capitalist pyramid. ID 2020 efforts running through the United Nations will ensure no one gets left behind, but few are aware that the US Department of Homeland Security bankrolled much of the World Wide Web Consortium's work in the digital identity space. And so as I prepared these remarks today, I couldn't help but mull over the intelligence community's interest in signals intelligence, weaponized narrative, simulation, predictive modeling, and social contagion. How will our collective voices today ripple through this militarized cloud architecture into the general consciousness and beyond? Such are the thoughts that haunt the corners of a Zoom consciousness. Bluffdale and the NSA always out on the horizon, you know. But um, those of us with eyes to see have the duty to speak. And so I am here today as a mother. I am here as a mapper of geographies of power, as a voracious LinkedIn profile reader and a viewer of obscure government webinars. I'm here as a resident of Philadelphia, a smart city set up for predatory what works data-driven government. I'm here to shine uh, light on municipal nudge units funded by self-interested foundations seeking to replace civil servants with apps that manage citizens as agents in behavioral economic equations. 
I am here as a human relative among a multitude of non-human beings on this beautiful earth that has not yet been re remade as a planetary computer for social impact investors. And I am here as a lover of stars who opposes the weaponization of space, the atmosphere and our weather systems. And I'm here as a voice of, for peace who views 5G and the planned 6G installations as a domestic military occupation. I am here to speak of Davos's plans to deny us the opportunity to atone communally for and begin to remedy the devastation capitalism has wrought against nature and indigenous people. And I am here because we have entered a cyborg era in which sociopathic billionaires and defense contractors want to fundamentally alter what it means to be human, tapping nanotechnology and morally bankrupt scientists to do their dirty work. To the wealth hoarders, uh, the masses exist as nodes in the internet of bodies, nodes that must be separated from the cosmic dance through force of law, hydrogel biosensors and blockchain. Will you own the ledger or will the ledger own you? We are looking at a future where the masses will forfeit their innate human freedoms in exchange for behavioral currency needed to survive within their panopticon. Human capital bonded, each life calculated according to its perceived burden on the coming robot society, at least in the eyes of hedge fund traders as they place their bets. Don't worry, there's safety on the continuum of care pathway. Just do as you're told and keep your social credit score where it needs to be. Every move in every country advancing lockstep, a playbook aligned to strategic investments made over decades by philanthropic capitalists like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Pierre Omidyar, Steve Ballmer, and Mark Benioff. Will human rights mean anything once financiers, faith community endowments, health insurers, pensions, and even sovereign wealth funds hold our futures in escrow? Rockefeller Foundation funded think tank change agents have cleared the way for life to be railroaded into virtual space for our own good, for the good of the planet uh, in service of the World Bank's One Health Initiative. So the oligarchs will use the UN Sustainable Development Goals to justify imprisoning the planet and humanity using sensor networks. And once the electrical engineers have nature and humanity firmly in their grip, transnational global capital will channel its concentrated wealth through our bodies, our social relationships and our non-human kin. And as we stand on this threshold, questions must be asked. Who intends to rule life on earth? To what end and on whose authority? John Trudell, leader of the American Indian movement, poet and prophetic voice has expressed that it is our responsibility to use the intelligence gifted to us by the creator to be thinkers and to go up against the machine of tech, no logic. And so I am here today um, on behalf of women of the world to say that we do not consent to Davos's fourth industrial revolution. And in this battle of sacred and profane, we stand ready to defend the children and the earth from further predation and to strive towards a future of reciprocity and abundance and spirit. And we stand firm in our power, full of love and light, ready to face off against Klaus Schwab's pharmacolonial technocracy of necromancers. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. Right time. Um, I mean, and I think I'm, I'm excited to talk more, more about this. I, I do want to say, like, you know, or my question, my first question is sort of what, how, how do we understand the pandemic? You know, that it's there. And I, I, you know, so that's my only worry about it. Like, I'm thinking seriously about how we're all in our boxes here and we can't be together. Because yeah, it's by design. Somebody's making a lot of money off of that. <laughs> but we can talk more later. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Thank we, you. Will talk, we will talk more later, but my students are here and I'm not sure everybody is going to be staying for the whole thing. Oh. So I really do want to say, especially in light of the previous presentation about junk news, that I personally am not comfortable with, um, a, you know, a, a framework that is presenting the pandemic as a conspiracy to push tech. <laughs> um, I believe that these that 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 there are people who are profiting um, and who are exploiting a state of emergency, but that is not the same as saying it is all part of a vast plan. Um, are you not familiar with the Great Reset? I am familiar with pandemic and a lot no, of this is the Great Reset. Reset. This is Klaus Schwab, the World Economic I, Forum. It's I, a whole book. <laughs> I am familiar, but I but my students are here. This is an academic setting. Yeah, I would encourage people to go to the World Economic Forum's website and look up. Um, they actually have 
There's a whole book from Klaus Schwab that lays out um, the Great Reset. It's integral with COVID and um, the new normal. And it's, it's very clear. This is documented in primary sources. Allison, I've, I've written about the, the opportunism. I've written books about exploiting states. Of Are you emergency. saying that Klaus Schwab isn't advancing a Great Reset program? I am saying that the, that the pandemic is real, that it is not a Did vast- Did I say that it wasn't real? You said that this is not a public health emergency. <laughs> You said I think at this right. point we are not in a public. That is my opinion. In That's this point of the game, that we are and not it's out of line with 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 the scientific consensus. And I just want to say that clearly because this is. An well, I think it is useful. I would encourage everyone to actually go and look to um, the documentation that I have regarding the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the arrangements with the World Economic Forum, our biometric identity, and how that interfaces with um, the track and trace programs. Because it's really very important, and you can, you can people can have different understandings of the nature of public health, but um, this is all happening. Okay, I just needed to say that, and I and and I know our students are developing their critical capacities. I love that. That's great. And I encourage them to go to my blog because I have tremendous links. And I, what I, I say, I would love to be wrong about this. I don't I don't actually particularly want for this to be a great reset to go forward, but. Um, based on the information, there are serious concerns regarding um, the fourth industrial revolution. And I think that as, um, as a powerful woman, I have the right to say that this is not a course of humanity that we are willing to pursue within the context of what is rolling out in a, in a global technological um, surveillance state. That's my right, but you're welcome to have your opinion. Nobody is saying it's not your right, um, but I think that this is a Rutgers event and there are lots of students here and I think we need to be clear about the public health emergency that we're in and just continue the discussion. Yep, we'll continue it. That'd be great. So, um, you know, I think people bring different things to the conversation around um, like shared narrative and journalism and stories. And so I think in some ways, a lot gets caught up in framing and words and terms and very loaded. And I, I know like the false news or the junk news, that's certainly, you know, a big piece of that. I come at things um, because I'm outside of academia and I'm like outside of paid journalism. Um, and I'm really into this struggle because as a mother, I'm trying to figure out how this goes forward, like in, in for all of humanity is, um, my background is in cultural landscapes and I go very broad. So I pull all sorts of information in and I, I sort of synthesize it, but then I share it back out with people. And I say, you know, how does this sound to you? Because as we know, there's this information overload, right? Like we can't any one person possibly absorb it all. And so um, I'm like, this is how I see things right now. Like, what, what do you think? Do you have something to add? And it's, it's a more fluid and less sort of authoritarian aspect of understanding the world. And I think um, you know, it was so beautifully said over time, right? Like what is reality? What is truth? And um, I think it's in an industry that wants to sort of harness everything as data, um, there's, there's, you know, an interest in having some, you know, ostensible real truth. But I think ultimately our goal should be to educate people to take in a lot of information and come to terms um, with their own morality and their own understanding of the world to what that actually is. So, um, just in response, because I know that there's a lot of sort of framing around right-wing journalism or certain things, is just to counterbalance. Um, I was at an event a couple of years ago in Philadelphia where essentially um, all of our nonprofit media, which at this point includes our daily paper of record, um, everything from a small Afrofuturous podcast to all of the, the um, uh, like, the, uh, the Spanish language paper, the African American paper, all of these organizations were brought into a meeting to sort of map our networks and get everybody on the same page about how we would present things. And um, this was part of an effort called Solutions Journalism Network. And this Solutions Journalism Network um, is backed by these major foundations and tech companies. Um, it's been going on for about eight years and they're in about 200 journalism schools and they're training people for what they call solutions, right? And what these solutions are 
in many respects align with the social impact investors. And this grew out of the fix it column in the New York Times op ed. Right. So for all intents and purposes, most people would think that is at sort of a pinnacle of the New York Times for not fake news. Right. Like the New York Times is not fake news. And yet there's a political economy built in that has been built into the nature of journalism now that is advancing, um, uh, you, you know, this way that they see the world that is not everyone is familiar with those motivations right not most people don't know about solutions journalism they don't understand that the media has been restructured as a social impact market for measurable behavior change so they don't call it propaganda but they actually say like we're going to make documentaries we're going to make videos we're going to make films and we're going to fund them with venture capital and it's going to be based on how many clicks and and actually to the point of even changing legislation and that this was part of a webinar at columbia um business school where they were talking about impact media and they're like oh well don't tell anybody Psst, you know this is the woman formerly at harvard business school don't tell anyone that we're trying to change legislation with our documentaries but we're venture capitalists and we do tranches of investment and what we invest in is is um, media that will change policy. So, you know, I think when we have this broader discussion of what is fake news, fake news, I think some people would frame it as, oh, this is a, um, you, you know, a, a schlocky article or a meme or something that's meant to, meant to distract. Um, it can also be very highly sophisticated and financialized. <laughs> you know, this is a huge market. And, and I would just say all of these same players who are involved in impact investing are also pouring money into journalism. So I had mentioned Omedia our Network. I was at an event at our free library with Snowden and Jeremy Scahill from Intercept was, was um, it was a remote event. And I, so I went because I was all about ed tech and surveillance. I'm like, these are my people. I'm gonna like flyer and let people know that this technology is a problem. Um, and afterwards I spoke with Mr. Scahill and in, in but then I looked at Omidyar Network and I realized they're, they're involved with good ID, digital identity, and digital education. Those are their social impact sectors, right? And, and I emailed him because he was very engaged with me. He had had young kids and he was seeing the problems. And I'm like, y'all aren't probably going to cover ed tech surveillance, are you? Like, there, 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 there's a conflict, a potential conflict. And, and I never got a resolution on that. But I think it, when we talk about... We used to understand manufactured consent. <laughs> we used to understand that that was how it is, that the, the, the powers that be are concentrated in controlling the media. And it's changed and now we have social media. But um, I just, I, I wanna bring the solutions journalism part into it because it relates to what I had said earlier. So thanks. It's interesting because a lot of my work, I try to consider it within the idea of like indigenous knowledges and cultural erasure and sort of colonialism and, and this discounting of earlier oral histories, right? And narrative histories that are dynamic for the written word, right? That all happened. And now this feels like somewhat an extension on that. Um, I will say as much as like I've mentioned Yasha Levine's book, uh, The Surveillance Valley and the Military, like there are, there are many negative aspects of social media, but the, the reality is, is that you can find so much original source material, right? And so many people are operating within limited bounds of what is commercially viable or academically acceptable, like within certain frames. And so there are people who exist outside of those things who are willing to go to primary resources and, and synthesize knowledge and share it in creative ways. And I think we should consider it, um, you know, I, I, I'm not putting my work up against the New York Times. I, I mean, I, I have some friends, I make these beautiful maps and she's like, it's like art, right? So that's almost like when I bring to my, it's, it's an artistic, understanding of facts as I've gathered them that is shared collectively. Um, so I think a lot of this work is just based on um, having a situation arise and then digging in, digging into the source material. And those things that people can't deny, those are, that is not true, right? Like the LinkedIn's, the World Bank videos, that they're not real. Those are the primary sources and they're very available. So um, the other piece, I love the, the, the piece about technocracy because I agree very much. I mean, I think there's some squabbling whether what we're looking at is you know, uh, communitarianism or, te you know, techno technocratic, but the idea of an industrial engineered society, if anyone hasn't read um, uh, Zamyatin's novel, We, you know, that's, it's, it's kind of a dry book, but that's, it feels like that's what we're marching towards is, is a, um, you know, a world governed by algorithms and a very dehumanized um, anti-life sort of world. Um, and what I wanted to bring to this is what I'm saying is there's a political economy uh, behind measured behavior change, uh, behind 
health data, behind education data, behind food and nutrition. There are all of these financialized markets that are coming up on this. And um, I, I was doing some work this week where the reskilling, so now we have global reskilling coming online because every, you know, many people have been put out of work and they'll be reskilled to build the Panopticon, right? So that's what they're going to be reskilled to be coders and work in pharma. You know, that's, that's, those are the skills. And they're going to fund that with income sharing agreements. And these debt instruments are actually um, going to be securitized. And the very same people who crashed the global economy the last time out, this guy, Christopher Riccardelli, who is the grandfather of CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, he's in on the same game. So it's fascinating if you understand that there are financialized markets that are linked to AI high frequency trading. When you think about technocracy and industrial engineering and engineered economies, um, you know, and that there are people who are shorting outcomes, right? We have what works um, programs, but there are people who are going to say, I I'm going to make money if it doesn't work. Right. And then you put it in AI and maybe a decentralized autonomous organization fueled by Chan Zuckerberg and Gates Foundation money and Bloomberg philanthropies and you like let it go. And that's a terrifying prospect. I think all of us who are working in tech spaces need to like dial it back and think about what happens when it gets away from us. Like because the finance piece and the military piece are embedded in all of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I sort of stake a claim for humanity. Um, you know, I will embrace being false or broken or, you know, any of these things. I'm fine with that because I'm human, right? And I will, I, I'm fine to be, stand to be corrected um, and to collaborate and to build. And I, I think having something as dynamic um, and participatory is really important. So anyway, that's my two cents. A lot of what we were talking about today around data surveillance, you know, I think what's going to be lifted up is that we can have these digital identities and that we can own our data and we can be brands. And, you know, beyond the, as we had mentioned, the environmental impacts of, you know, the e-waste and the energy and all of that that goes along with those technologies, the idea that if, if we agree to become data commodities, um, there is something behind it called Ocean Protocol that MIT spun out where they can on, um, do querying on encrypted data. Right. And so the impact markets, you may still own your data, but the impact investors will be able to access it to see if the uh, online preschool is good or if your telemedicine thing is evidence based and has impact. And so what I'm saying is we talk about labor, like organizing with labor in the fourth industrial Re revolution is do we actually believe that we should have a right to face to face relationship based education, um, health care, that we should have human beings taking care of our young and our old, and that humanity is a part of this equation because, um, you know, we need to be very clear about that because once we agree to be a data commodity for the impact market with Ocean Protocol, all of that stuff will be platformed permanently and in globalization 4.0, which means um, the lowest bottom wages, micro work, nobody gets any kind of good quality of life. And so we would just have to be really clear about these technologies. And in that respect, I, was, I, I, I collaborated on a resolution that was passed in California and later at the national meeting of the NAACP last summer in Detroit, um, where they wrote a resolution saying that no one should be compelled to, to create a digital identity to access public benefits. That includes education, healthcare, housing, judicial involvement. You should not, no one should make you create a digital identity to access these things. And it was unanimously passed with exception of some small group in Brooklyn that was looking to data mine kids in New York City schools. So that passed, that exists, and there's a model. So it's not just random people saying this is a problem. It's the NAACP um, looking at racial capitalism in the context a blockchain. But meanwhile, currently in Chula Vista, California, which is a, an area of San Diego, students are being asked to give blood tests for COVID on blockchain. Okay, so think about that. Essentially, what we're saying is that children to have right of face-to-face -face education um, are having their blood bodily fluids taken and uploaded to a blockchain health record. And that is happening through their school district. And no one's talking about that yet. And nobody really knows about this blockchain resolution. And, and when we talk about abolition, like for me, I feel like this is the next abolition movement is blockchain identity. Because if we agree to become data commodities with privacy to protect us from surveillance, it's over. So I just, I think that's really important for people to know because no mainstream media is going to put that out. And it's not fake news because you can Google it. They have the PDF of their 2019 resolutions online. It's page 62. So...